Welcome to this week's edition of The Neuro Show, your home of unfiltered cycling chat. We have Jesse Coyle in the house and we have Tyler Pierce, the vegan cyclist. In today's episode, we're going to go deep into the gravel scene. What is riding after 40 really look like? China Cycling released the new L2 group set, glucose monitoring, hookless rims, and who? is your Strava nemesis. But before we get into it, I need to quickly clarify the bin chicken is okay. I can confirm the bin chicken lived. All right, let's get into it. So gentlemen, I need your help this week. Uh, I'm the best part of 40, either side of it. You can work that out at some point. Okay, here's the thing with my cycling at the moment, right? So I'm doing lots of crits. I'm I'm kind of enjoying them. I'm not particularly good at them. They're not suited to me. And I kind of been thinking a little bit more about it. Like, this is not a sustainable way to get my competitive kind of juices out of the sport because, well, like I'm kind of old. So it has me thinking about all these other events that kind of come up on the calendar. And I know I'm being sort of pushed to do sort of off-road stuff. Why do I now want to do an event that's going to take three days because I've got to get there and back and the event might take a day to do. What do you think? What do you think I should do? Sell me on this stuff. Yeah. Well, so you do a lot of crit racing, right? So that's like how much that costs? 20 bucks. 30 bucks. Yeah. 20 bucks. All right. Well, imagine a sport where it's 15 times as much. Cool. Okay. I mean, I, that now like you're going to be like, what? No, but it's really amazing. You get to spend around $300 for an entry to a gravel race. Now, how far do you usually have to drive for those crits? Oh, uh, mate, I ride to the drive. Like, what? yeah, I just ride, ride oh. there and back. Done. Well, let me introduce flying. You get to go to an airport and you get to fly across the country and you have to fly with your bike and get through all of those hurdles. Um, so that's another really huge upside. Um, you know, another big thing is how long is a crit? Uh, 60 minutes. Yep. Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Now enter eight hours minimum. I mean, now that is, that is, (laughs) we are getting to the peak bit of, of racing here now with a crit or road racing. Um, what they, they do this crazy thing where they take people of similar skill and age and put them into a bracket. No, not with gravel, dude. We are all racing together. All right. So if you've just bought a bike or if you're a world tour pro, you're on the start line shoulder to shoulder. Now, let's imagine um, you want to win one of these events. Well, are you a full time world tour pro? Are you a world champion? Are you an ex tour de France smasher? Are you not? Okay, sorry, but you're not going to win. But don't you like gravel? What's going on here? You're the, you're a gravel fan. Well, where is the? Surely there's a part that you enjoy because you and everyone else is telling us we should be doing gravel. So, what are we missing here? I love gravel. I genuinely think it's the pinnacle of cycling when you compare every aspect. You can't just be a one dimensional rider, and I think crit racing is is pretty much like as one dimensional as you can get. I mean, you have to have obviously amazing bike handling skills, but if you are packing an 1800 watt sprint, it's going to be very hard for you to not do well in a crit, right? But that doesn't matter if you go into gravel, you you could, you could, uh, um, Ashton Lambie world record holder, right? Track star. I mean, just an absolute beast. And that skill set doesn't really apply to gravel racing because by the time you get to that finish line, you have had to have so many things go right. You know, you had to have the luck, but you had to have the feeling and you have to have the endurance and you have to have the race strategy. Uh, You have to also know who to go with and who not to go with. I mean, there's so many dynamics to it that it makes it for someone who isn't the best in one discipline be able to at least be somewhat competitive. Which suits now, you, I mean, Chris. That's you. Like, that's your, you as a rider. Is, like, can't really sprint, but is fit and but has a decent kick. I, I hear what you're saying. And, like, all I like, hearing from you over and over about this, Tyler, is, like, it's more about the experience than the competition. And that's, and maybe this is me just being selfish as a, like, 
get over it, Chris, you're over 40. Like maybe you should just ditch any thoughts of being competitive. But like to me, like I love the bar to, not the bar to bar physically, but like obviously, but the trying to attack guys in groups and, and that sort of basically trying to win. Okay, that's that's actually what I'm saying. I, I actually try and, and would love to kind of win things, podium things. And all I'm hearing really from Tyler is like, you're going to have this amazing experience. It's going to test your inner soul and all that crap. And I'm going to finish 68th and then I've got to try and tell my wife that I had a really good day out finishing 68th and my nine-year-old will go, well, is this is that a finisher's medal, Dad? Like they give you medals for finishing? Like I thought you only get a medal for winning. Like, yeah, okay, but okay, so, so 68th would be – Pretty bad. I mean, the thing is that there's huge numbers. You know, a lot of times you're racing against a thousand people. And so top 100, I know, sounds like, you know, not that great. But look, if you get 25th, the the 24 guys ahead of you are usually full time pros or like this is what they're doing. And so you, you know, not to stand on the shoulder of giants, right? But like uh, at, at, at Heiko, at Gravel Locos, I got ninth. I got top 10. And first through eighth were all professionals. And so I was like, hell yeah, dude. I'm like among these elites that I really shouldn't even belong here. Uh, but I was able to, you know, to do certain things that wasn't just like my FTP was massive. And the race aspect, look, it is it is some of the best racing you'll find because it's not just like, Oh, this guy hit the climb and he's gone. You know, he hits the climb and maybe he gets a gap on it, but you're a good descender. So you bring it back or he has to stop at a rest stop and refuel, but you brought a hydro pack, you know, or it, you hit a sand section and now you have better bike handling skills. And so this just like whole matrix of what it is to be a cyclist comes into play. And so you feel really, uh, like vindicated maybe, or, or you just feel good when you just finish because there's so many elements that you're fighting outside of just people. But I think you're a bit confused, Chris, because that sounds more like something you'd want to do because I think you've got the bug for crits because it's all you've been doing for the last couple of months, but you're a grand Fondo guy. Like that's your jam. I think when we go to snowy classic in a week, I think, and you do that again and you get a reminder of what that's like, you'll get that feeling, which is closer to a gravel race than it is a, um, you know, a crit. Oh, don't get me. My, my first love, my only love is a Fondo. Like I'm not, that, that is to me the pinnacle of our sport. Like, you <laughs> know, getting, the, getting the, the sticker on the front of the helmet, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I love that. But so you talk about these pros, these gravel pros. And I hear you saying this and some of the names mean something to me because they were world tour pros and that kind of stuff. But like what what is a gravel pro? I saw Francis's video and he was riding with with a female gravel pro and okay, well, a good example would be uh Colin Strickland. He went out and he won unbound. Uh he was at the time the first person to ever go sub 10 hours. And he beat um the whole EF education uh, squad, like Lachlan Morton was there. Uh, Taylor Finney was there and he just rode away from these guys. EF then came to him and said, Hey, we'll give you a pro contract. We'll take you world tour. And he turned it down and he got a lot of shit for it. People were like, why doesn't he want to do that? Because at the time it was still, well, the pinnacle is Europe racing. And I actually was able to chat with him a bit. And I, I, I to, honestly, I thought he's not going because he's doping, right? Like, because there's no sanctioning in gravel racing. Like you could be doped. You could just literally have syringes sticking in your face and not, no one's testing. So I thought that's why he didn't go. But then he told me, well, I'd have to give up my Red Bull contract. I'd have to give up my bike contract. He was sponsored by a coffee shop. So he was like, they're willing to pay me $19,500 for the year. And I have to give up all my sponsors to go do that. So he's going to trade a $300,000 a year salary for $19,500. What would you do? The money's better because as you've said there, like even example I've got in in that scene, for, especially for guys that aren't well beaters on the road, 
like a guy like Eva Slick, I think one unbound maybe two years ago. He was he was just on a Conti team, probably getting a, not even a salary, maybe just like a stipend per year. Had a few results on the road at like the dot pro level. Was not really amazing. Probably not really making any money by the time you get to the end of the year. And then comes into the gravel scene and he'd be making really good money now based on well, based on that single result. So if, especially if you're not a Primoz Roglic, uh, yeah, if you can get into the US scene and get results in the gravel financially. How does this work for a like 41-year-old man living in San Francisco? Like is he... Is he now on? Is his weekend training rides now like a twelve-hour gravel day? Like, because I kind of look at it like, well, I try to use the best time I have, and we always hear it like people are time crunched; they can only train like eight, ten hours a week, whatever it might be. I'm not going to spend an hour of that driving to and from the gravel part. That you know this that if you want to have a better twelve-hour power, you don't go do twelve-hour rides. I mean, that's just not. That's not how it is. So it, as a 40 something year old, it's actually, I would say a better discipline for you because there's so many other things you can control. If you're 45 years old, are you going to jump into a 45 minute a level crit and go off the front? Like, no, dude, you're going to have to have so much specified training to have such a razor sharp knife just to stay in the pack. But with gravel, you have a little bit of bike handling skills. You know, you choose the right tires, you know how to fuel, and then you average 220 watts for eight hours. No, well, I think that's the part exactly I don't like, that you're basically starting and then you're like, well, you know, 10 people are going to get a, 10 people ahead of me will get a flat, one will break the chain, three will crash. Uh, it's just like the snipers taking out everyone ahead of you. And then One so guy will drop his GoPro. Yeah, yeah. You're kind of getting result off the back of relying on other people fucking up. It's like, I don't know. It's a weird kind of uh, reverse sportsmanship. That's the other thing is I don't understand when people go gravel stupid. You should only do this or, or you know, you crits are stupid. You should only do that. Do it all. Like, it's not a big deal. You, you can be well versed. All right, guys, let us know down below. What should I be doing? Should I be getting into gravel? Stick with crits. Is it all just overrated? And this camera angle is brought to you by someone who gave us a super thanks not long ago. We're going to have a few different camera angles that allow us to do a few more of these as we go along. YouTube updates China Cycling's YouTube channel. Uh, he did a video releasing the first look at the L2 electronic group set. So we're finally seeing... The Chinese group sets go electronic, so it's a 12-speed uh, group set. I didn't really care too much. You know, proof will be in the pudding. We're going to see when it comes out. But damn, that looks like Shimano. I don't know how they're getting around or they don't care about patents or whatever it is. But, I mean, that's that's a, that's a DI2 if I've ever seen one. All right. I, I still kind of feel like this is fake news and it's it will get there. It will definitely get there. But this is just not the finished article. You haven't used it, Chris. So you're going, I'm going to, I'm going to, all right. So here's the thing, because you're doing similar to what, so the new SRAM Eagle thing got released and Peak Talk did a video on it. And here's my, here's my thing. New product comes out. Neither you nor him have tested it. So fair enough to look at the pictures and say, in theory, with my engineering background, I don't think this is going to work and I think this could be problematic and I think this this is no one knows until you test the stuff. So I appreciate looking at things from a critical point of view, but until you've actually tested it, you, these are all just theories about stuff which may or may not work and you don't know until you test it. So this sort of the speculation around the products is kind of like let's just be to, like it sounds right. funny coming from me, but let's just be optimistic until you've yeah, okay. seen it. In no, I'll, I'll give you that. I'll 100% give you that. But my my kind of pushback is this stuff is being launched like it's legit. Yeah, I, I watched I watched that video and unfortunately it didn't fill me with confidence. Guys with flat sneaker shoes <laughs> doing a descent and then like, uh, women riding up a climb, but the the camera was just focused on the lady, not on the shifting or the gears or anything. And then the the shot of the gears changing was like this bizarrely out of framed 
shot with the the chain slapping about the place. And I'm like, is this is this selling me on this product? Like, are you kidding me? That part of the video where he's talking about the uh, the actual product wasn't even the bit that really struck me the most. The bit I was most keen about and most hyped about is this business that he's starting, pandapodium.cc. So let me explain this one. So Joe from China Cycling that runs that channel, he lives in China. He's worked for Winspace. He's in the industry. He can go and see the, the brands and the factory straight up. So he's starting a business where he's got – he's basically – hopefully going to be the worldwide distributor of a bunch of these Chinese brands. So on the website here, Panda Podium, he's got Winspace, L2, Magin, uh, XKD Power Meters, Yolio, who we chatted about last week. And this, I feel, is a potential game changer, industry changer, right? Because you've got him, he can select the brands that are good, which is the most important part. You got an AliExpress, you don't know what the fuck you're getting. It's a total crapshoot. So if you can have someone like him that can actually test the products in person and say, okay, I'm going to stand behind this and list it on the website, that's a win. And then if you can go here, and this was always a, my problem with these parts is you're ordering, I'm going to get wheels from here and a saddle and then a power meter and then a group set. And then you've just got this mismatch of parts from all over the world. Uh, if he can, If you can go on his site, and essentially spec up a whole bike from frame to handlebars to group set and have that all shipped to you from him as a distributor. Well, uh, I know Joe, I've talked with him a little bit. Um, and you know, uh, wind space and Lund wheels have, have, um, done a lot from my, uh, race team and I've chatted with them and, you know, there's some talk about trying to do some stuff with impossible routes and, uh, he's, he's really a nice guy and, and is trying to do some really cool things in the industry. Fair play to him. Joe, is it like that is, that's a big responsibility, like in terms of putting your name next to a lot of these brands and then distributing them out to the world. There's huge potential there, but I would, um, say there's, there's risk. And, you know, fair, fair play to him for having a go at this. Like, this could be a, a life changer for him. Yeah, it's just I don't know how he's going to get around, like, the how he's going to be a distributor. Like, can he sell to me in Australia? Because he's already an Australian distributor. So he's going to have to really get friendly with the uh, the manufacturers and the brands to be able to sell them where he needs to. Because, yeah, it's going to be shit if you can't ship them to the countries you want. Or have it like, oh, I've picked 10 products and only half of them I can come to Australia. That would kind of ruin it. Do you want to talk about the new SRAM thing? I mean, I don't really have a take on it, but you got any take on it? I think we're going to have to go you, to Tyler to this one. I, I didn't. I've got no freaking idea about mountain bike group sets. <laughs> What's my opinion? Well, so I run mountain bike group sets on my road bikes. I have this SRAM Eagle. I don't have this new one, but I have the SRAM Eagle uh, derailleur on my Aero Road, my Ultimate, my gravel bikes, my time trial bike. Uh, I run it. I run that because I can have basically a, a, a an 1152 rear cog um on any one of my bikes i i really like one by and so that's the thing i will say though it's a great idea to me because just the other day i was bringing in my mountain bike the rear wheel was off i barely tapped the wall with the derailleur and it snapped the hanger and i was like that is so annoying <laughs> you know i was just like it i barely touched it and then uh, the day before, uh, ultra distance nationals, I had put my, I was changing out wheels. I put my road bike upside down saddle on hoods and it just twisted and fell and hit the, uh, derailleur hanger and then totally snapped it. Uh, right before a gravel race, I just dropped my bike over barely on the grass and it bent the derailleur hanger and like made a crack in it. If, if they, if they pinning their colors to this flag, this is massive. Like it, this is a potential game changer, definitely. I'm super skeptical of it, like having dealt a little bit with dropouts and, and that kind of stuff with the Devel frames and just the, the variations even in the same mould that's been coming out. Like I have no idea how they're going to get around those variations. And then there's no uh, high, low limit screw either. Like it blows my mind that they're going to to work this out. But God, if they do, yeah, I, I'm with you. I was going to say, do you reckon brands are going to bike frame manufacturers going to come out and say, oh, you can't run SRAM Eagle on this? I feel like it's good. Like I agree, Tyler, like it's good. 
until the point where it's too much and then your frame <laughs> snaps and you're like, oh, I wish I just had a bent hanger. It's a really good point uh, that I didn't think of is that, you know, having a, a failure point, which is a $4 piece is so much better than having a failure point being your entire frame. So when we had the Bianchis, they they forced you to run their um, dropout. No, sorry, their Redirella hanger was theirs, and it was it was like play doh. It was so soft, and it was that for that exact reason is that they wanted all the impact to be taken by that by that soft hanger, and none of it to come up through the. The, the frame itself. Just, I just want to push back slightly on you, Jesse. And the only reason like I'm Mr. Negative Pants today, right, is just that, that, that Tyler pointed out. Like the moment that gets released, I just see all these frothers who have never ridden it or know anything about it, like posting stuff like game changer and all this sort of stuff. And you're like, just chill. Just, can we all just chill out? And see how this plays out. And I just, there's a few particular individuals that just gripes me because I'm like, you haven't written this and you're just trying to do it to, yeah, sorry. That's, that was why I missed the negative on, on some of this stuff today. All right. Oh, don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm up. usually with you on there in terms of like all the new shit comes out and it's like, oh, we got a fork recall and a handlebar recall because all the stuff we designed <laughs> actually doesn't work. So I, I just, yeah. <laughs> Potentially, you are. You're right. Yes. Pro cycling. We'll keep this shortish as usual. New UCI rule from June this year, uh, which I think I'm a big fan of. So what's going to happen is when a well to a team signs a, a neo pro, a, a, a rider going professional for the first time, they need to pay the Conti team or club that that rider's coming from two thousand euros for every year they were at that team or club. So for example, when Jay Vine went to Alperson, went pro. He was on Nero Continental for one year. So Nero would get 2,000 euros as a payment for essentially developing that rider, which I think is fantastic because it helps support the lower level teams and the clubs that do a lot of the groundwork to get the riders to come up. So yeah, I'm a big fan. What do you guys reckon? I absolutely love it. Obviously, you know, might might have kept the team afloat for a bit longer. I'd like to see him go a little bit further. I would love to see on every rider's jersey. So they have maybe on the back of their jersey when they're in the pro peloton, they just have like a, the list or the, the name of the team that they came from. I reckon that would be such a cool little like nod or even just on the sleeve, just a nod to the team that they came from. And then like that team, like from the team perspective where they came from, they get to just shout about that and go and point and look at the guy and go, you know, we did that, we, we did that and – you then get to go to a sponsor, a local sponsor, and say, hey, look at the guy riding in the, the Vuelta this year. He's got a mark that showed that he came from our team. Like, get behind us. It just gives us more cred when you are going to try and keep your amateur shit show bike team alive to, to have that kind of thing. I love it. I, I just want to see more of it. Kristen Faulkner. She was third in uh, Strati Bianchi, and there was a picture of a glucose monitor uh, on her shoulder under her jersey, uh, and they disqualified her from that race. Now, one of the things, so then it stirred up all this controversy of like, well, wh what is a glucose monitor? Is it a performance enhancement? Is it doping? Uh, and I guess there was a rule on that you can wear it. It just can't be feeding the information to your head unit. I was under the impression that it was banned entirely from racing. You're allowed to use it in training. Racing, you're not allowed to use them at all unless you're diabetic. I don't think they should have banned her or, or disqualified her. I mean, I guess like rules are rules, but like it just seems, it just seems harsh. No, nah, it, it, the rules are not that hard. I knew you can't use a blood glucose monitor. The D, like coming back to our chat we had the other week, Chris, the DS knows you can't use a blood glucose monitor. It's the it's the team's job to make sure the riders are. I mean, she. Could have genuine just genuine be genuinely been clueless, in which case the team needs to needs to sort that out. So for, from what I from what I understand, there was a gray area about the rule being that is you could wear it as long as the data wasn't used. I reckon you've been on some uh, you've been on some Kristen Faulkner Kool Aid. I'm I almost a hundred percent certain they are outright flattened out banned from being anywhere on your body when you're racing in a UCI race. 
I wouldn't have thought it's particularly relevant as real time information. So I don't even know why the team would put them on her, like if, even if there was a grey area, because you know it's as I said, it's not like that this thing is going to indicate a situation that you can rectify necessarily during the race. From from so, what I can, from what I've read, it's got it's not really going to be used. It's not really used in the most intense periods of the race. You're probably using it more for bef- like the hour before you start. And then the easier points in the race, like if a stage starts really early, monitoring blood glucose over the first, let's say, three hours where they're doing 100 watts noodling along to make sure that the fueling is at a level that's um, adequate for the work that's being done. But when the, when the, when it's, you know, when the attacks start and the race starts in earnest, it's essentially useless because you already know what you need to do. And it's not, yeah, it's, it's not entirely reflective of fuel that's available for your muscles. It's uh fluctuates a bit more well i've thought a lot about this uh and and so what is the difference between someone's just genetic ability to have high testosterone levels high growth levels high epo levels just naturally right like your hemocrit being you know phil guyman says his hemocrit's like 50 like almost if he gets tested it's like you're borderline in that red of doping because just naturally his hemocrit's so high and so is it How would it be doping if someone had low test levels and low hemocrit and they took something that got them even? Chris is five foot eight, I'm six foot two. I have a genetic advantage. That's the whole point of sport. (laughs) this This is a rant. I'm sorry, but I'm off. Elite sport is not for everyone. That is just the reality. We are not all created equal. You don't then get to alter the situation afterwards. No, 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 no. I was go, <laughs> I don't do want it, to do go it. down the uh, <laughs> gender stuff at this point in the in the show, but at some point. It's just not. It, elite sport is by its very nature unfair because there are just people who are better than you. I could do all the same training that Jay Vine did at the exact same age as Jay Vine. Jay Vine would be far better than me and there's nothing I can do about it. That's elite sport. He's Hemocrit is probably higher. His testosterone is probably higher. Well, there is higher. something you can do about it. You're just not allowed. <laughs> exactly. And that it's fucking super simple. Sorry, I shouldn't swear. Oh, yes, I should. But my, my biggest gripe, my biggest gripe when all this comes down to it is, is, is the, the TUE stuff, if we are going to go down this rabbit hole. Okay. That to me yeah. is still the area that shits me because it is exactly that, Tyler. It is people who are going, you know what, my levels of this are a bit low. I need a TUE to get myself back up to that to that level. And, like, I hate the TUE stuff. I think it's such a, a used and abused part of not just world tour sport, like it's rife in master's sport. Sorry, rant over. I tried every single discipline of racing and just sucked ass at every one of them. But when I started finding races that were 24-plus hours, I found that my inability to sleep uh, just normally um, actually was a huge genetic uh, adaptation. And I had this advantage where I just don't get sleepy. I don't get tired. And so then it's like, oh, sweet. Like I have this this genetic advantage, whereas other people might need to take amphetamines, right, to have that same level, uh, which I would be pissed at. I'd be like, well, that's not fair. Like I'm naturally doing this without that. And then you jump on, you know, some meth or something and then you're just like through the night like four days in a row like you're smashing i've only won one race ever it was a race where there was uh well i guess the the nationals but so the first race i'd ever won and put a video up of was three bikes you started on a gravel bike you got on a road bike you finished on a mountain bike okay so three different bikes it's like a triathlon of bikes uh and someone commented and i won And they said, you'd be better if you ate me. And I'm like, but I won, (laughs) you know, like what? So if I ate meat, would I win the tour de France? We've got, we've got two, two vegans here. One who it's a massive, well, that's actually a question we can kind of, we can kind of nut out. I'm not vegan by the way, I eat dairy. Do you think it influences your content? Like would, would your channel be the same if it was just called Tyler Pierce. I think you're mad for having vegan in there still. I think that's crazy. 
Uh, it's stuck. That's stuck around because it's not even really a part of your, um, you know, your identity online. Really, for most of the uh, most of the vids. A hundred percent. I think about it almost every day. Um, it would be easy to change on YouTube. It'd be very hard to change on Instagram. Uh, just the way that that it, you know, I, I got verified. Like if I change my name, I'm I'm dropping that verification. And anyways, uh, it. It's something I wish I hadn't gone down, but then I, I go back and I look at other people, let's just say the liver King, I mean, super popular, right? Like, and he used this dumb name, this, this screen name, you know, I wish I had not gone down that road because it just stops people instantly from being open to some of the content. Uh, but with that, cause everything is a give and take. So if there's a negative side to something, there'll be a positive side to something. And the positive side is that I've had a lot of people uh, reach out and say, I know you never talk about diet, but it just got me thinking. And now I've changed my diet and I've lost 40 pounds and you know I've stopped drinking alcohol. Like There's just all these crazy, amazing stories where people have turned their life around with those things. Do you want to talk about, Jesse, like, are you, so you're not vegan? Is there, is there, What's going on there? Is that? Oh, this is fucking hard. <laughs> like, I don't know how you do, especially like if I just, if I was just at home all day and could just cook all my food, I could probably do it. But um, especially when we were like traveling to races, when you're on the road and stopping at two petrol stations on the way to Victoria, if you're eating vegan, you're just eating shit because there's just nothing. Okay, like I could be better in prep food, but it's just having that option just to eat just to have the dairy foods is just better there's just healthier options at most of the places we stop so um that was probably that was that's what kicked it and now it's just like i don't know in a perfect world i would not eat dairy because ethically i don't really agree with it but anyway i i I just i i deal with that because my diet overall is healthier including it that's that's sort of been that was my takeaway from my what 18 months two years as it is I, i learned so much about food and so much about what my body needed, especially in that last six months where things were completely falling apart for me, um, that if I had had the knowledge at the beginning of of trying to be vegan and I went in with this like, oh, I'm just going to eat leaves and I'll be amazing. And that's not, your body doesn't, your body needs more than leaves, it turns out. And if I'd, if I'd known more about the food and what I needed and the macros and all that kind of stuff, then potentially I wouldn't have run into the big iron deficiency stuff. I was just going to say, I'll answer that. Just, I was just going to say like the people that do tr- go to a plant-based diet for health is like they'll never last more than a year Cause why, like, why, because then you'll realize like I don't need to do this to be healthy. So why the hell would you bother if you're just doing it for health? Like you, you can have a steak a week and you're not health's not going to go off a cliff. So uh, coming at, do, why would you do that for health? You, you don't want to ruin your body long term just because, in principle, you know, I'm going to starve myself and I'm going to eat Oreos because that's the only thing I have. Like, well, dude, that's not, that's yeah, not I don't ideal. take any, uh, I, yeah, uh, uh, I take a iron supplement and a B12 supplement. Um, but my iron's never been low. I take that for performance reasons. I've had multi- many blood tests and my iron's never been low, even when I wasn't taking iron. So if you're, because when if someone like goes, like eats predominantly plant based, they might have some sort of food allergy. Like Ben Carmen, for example, he's allergic to soy. So if he didn't know that, and then went vegan, his health would fucking go down the toilet. But it's just because he's allergic to probably one of the main food groups, he's going to be eating it. Which is what happened to me is the soy basically was was blocking my iron intake. Oh my, um, intake's not the right word. The right word is. Um, absorption. Did I did I put my body in that circumstance by just suddenly, all of a sudden, one day loading it with soy? Like literally on Tuesday, I decided soy was my massive, um, you know, protein intake, and like just everything was done. People hate soy. It. There's going to be so many comments on this video. By the way, in defense of soy, I drink soy milk and I eat tofu regularly. I'm a I'm a soy boy. So uh, yeah. No, not, no, let's not go trash and soy because it can it can be healthy if, if it doesn't if you're not allergic to it. I think we started that with pro cycling and ended up with some sort of vegan rant. So comment down below, guys, your thoughts on some of those subjects, and let us know should Jesse Coyle change his channel name to Soy Boy. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> Tire width. 
uh, here here in America, the uh, trend is going wider. Um, and I, I got thinking about this because there's a guy local to us. Um, this guy, this guy Steve Grusis, uh, done so much for local cycling. Like I got into cycling because of this this guy, but he is, I think, seventy five or, or maybe even older, right? Like he's been around for a while and he has this like steel framed bike that looks like it should be in a museum. And he still runs like 130 PSI on like 21 wide tires because that was the thing when he was right. You know what I mean? That was, that was what you did. And as science has come out a little bit more, use that loosely, but they kind of, you know, they started looking at the harder the tire, the more it would bounce off the road and actually your power delivery wasn't as good. So the harder PSI, and then now a wider tire is like supposedly more aero, even though it's like a bigger footprint. And so I saw in a very short period of time, you went from 23s, uh, were a thing, you know, to now I wouldn't run anything less than a 28, Like My road bike has 28s. My training bike has thirties. I love it right? For tubeless. Uh, uh, I run Kdex, so it's tubeless plus hookless. Um, and actually just recently I was, I was riding, I got a small little, um, you know, piece of glass in the tire, the sealant fixed it all, but it went down to 15 PSI by the time it sealed. And I still rode 30 more miles. I'm kind of considering doing a video on this because I have in the last six months, I've gone actually from, from actually Tyler, from when I rode with you and I got on that because I'd been riding 25s when basically for the last five years, right, whatever, 25s. And then I got on that bike that you lent me, lowered your saddle, didn't put it back up for you. That's another story. Um, and you had 28s on that. And I was like, I got on that bike and I'm like, oh, yeah, I, could, I, can, I can see there's something in this. So when I came back, put 28s on the, on the, the bike. And since then, I've gone 28s, I've ridden 30s, and on the uh, the titanium bike, I actually had 32s. And there's just this overwhelming kind of chat about like, well, you know, wider's faster and, you know, it's better rolling resistance and all this kind of stuff. But what they don't tell you is that only under certain circumstances, and the biggest circumstance being the width of the rim. The manufacturers tell you what the recommended tire is. So if you've gone and run a 28 on a rim that is designed for a 23 because some bloke told you it's quicker, that's your fault because the info has been out there if you if you went and looked. Did you consider Kadex in your, when you were looking at 80 mils? No, because I don't want hookless. I don't get hookless. What is wrong with a hook? <laughs> don't know. You know, I'm a uh, hooker. That, that it sounds cool. It, it, that, so, <laughs> so from what I understand, uh, yeah, from what I understand, and this was this was me getting information from people like in the industry uh, that wasn't affiliated with, was that it was a manufacturer um, benefit that it wasn't so much a performance benefit, but they could make the rim. They could manufacture it in one piece without having to have the secondary piece. And so it just made it easier to produce. Um, and, and so not necessarily that it has like this crazy performance benefit uh, outside of it's just better for the company. But then they obviously want to spin that into some way of like, oh, well, it's really better for you. Uh, speaking of Hubbard's crashing, uh, Chris, you've been writing uh, some some routes on the weekend and you're seeing a lot of weird number of crashes. I swear every Saturday I get a text being like, oh yeah, another one down bobbin heads. Well, I don't know whether this is, this has been happening this whole time or just all of a sudden I've started noticing this, but yeah, doing, doing some, some stuff out around bobbin head, which is like you guys have potentially seen, we talk about that place on the channel in the past, but it's just a climb. It's a really popular area in Sydney, but it is, it's a climb. So it's an uphill and a downhill, right? And every weekend for the last month, someone has binned it on the side of the road. And one of those days I pulled over, two of those days I pulled over to kind of help the guy out, whatever, and he was fine-ish. But I'm watching these people come down, right? I'm watching them come down past me and I would say 70% of them are all descending on the tops. I don't know. It, has this message not got out to people? Have we not watched 
enough videos to learn that we descend in the drops. It's responsibility of the ride leaders. I mean, okay, if this is riding with your mates, it's not. But that, these club rides will go out, and as we've said before, they'll sh- they're shouting everything out, pointing this, hands waving everywhere, and then like the basics of, hey, when you're descending, you should ride in the drops so your hands don't slip off, and that doesn't get covered. And I say it's true. You go you, when you're climbing up, like a bobbin head, for example, in a ten minute stretch. You maybe see 100 people and only 10 are in the drops that are coming the other way. And that's probably the main reason why people are crashing is because they hit a bump and their hands slip off and then they, they lose control. So just drop, like, you sh- you need to descend in the drops. Maybe it's a sort of brake setup as well. I think a lot of people don't use the drops because they can't reach their brakes as well. And that's just a setup thing, bring the bring the lever in. I actually like descending in the on the tops. Um I, I feel more comfortable there. Uh, but I understand what you're saying. You know, uh, I think another thing is a lot of times people don't pass along that information. Like it, we don't really have this, like how to ride clinic. You don't have to go get a license. And so then also you don't want to make someone feel stupid. You know, if I see someone doing something wrong, uh, no matter how much uh, like I should tell that person that comes off so douchey to tell them, hey, you're riding wrong. I I learned that lesson real hard. I did a free ride. So it was a two day free Fondo. And I brought up, you know, any, like it was free. You could come, it was fully supported. And so what ended up happening is a lot of people came that were so wildly underprepared for the route that I had chose. Obviously, Chris, you and I did that route together. um, So you know, you know, part of that route anyways. instantly the very first sharp turn and i told everyone hey there's a really sharp turn huge crash people flying all over the road blood everywhere and i'm just, you know, just dude we have gotten three miles into this ride and there's already people like almost having to go to the hospital and then there was a guy who came and he had a backpack full of his clothes with shoes on flat pedals and he was on the front drilling it And I told him, hey, man, we have like 6,000 feet of climbing and 30 miles. You should probably maybe not be going this hard. And then he he was like, I know what I'm doing. I've been riding for a long time. And then, you know, Mm. couldn't finish the ride, completely detonated himself. Do you have a Strava nemesis? So a Strava nemesis is someone who you log. Well, this is this is my reading on it. Okay, it's someone that you will log into Strava and you will start scrolling and you will see their ride. And it's it's this one person. And you will, it's not that you're necessarily competing with them. In fact, you might very well be friends with them, but you're going to go straight into that ride to see what they did. They're going to analyze it. You're going to, oh, God, you did 410 up that. Oh, that's, you know. Do you have one? Oh, yeah. Sam Hill, ex teammate from last year. Similar. So the, the, the reason to get a nemesis, they have to be like similar power output because, like, I can't be your nemesis because. I'm 20 kilos heavier. So the power is just like, doesn't make sense. It has to be someone on a similar level. And you're kind of going in like, oh, I did an FTP test. Oh, they're, oh, they're only at 380. Oh, geez, I'm at 390 right now. But then like, he'll come and smack my ass like six months later. So you, got, yeah, definitely I'd say Sam. No, yeah, I had um, a, an ex-teammate, this guy Chaz, uh, who I would say is like a friend, friend of me, right? Um, casual in, in acquaintance. But um, if he gets this KOM, anywhere near me. I have to go out and get it. And then I get it. And the very next day he goes and he gets it. And, you know, we've really elevated each other a lot because we both don't want each other on yep. top. Who's of that's, is yours? That's a I can't pick yours. I've been trying to think. So, who, who come on. To- you can totally pick mine. Seriously? No, you can't no, pick it. No. So, my, okay. My, mine's a little bit weirder in the sense that it's certainly not KOM based. It's, uh, it's pure just k's based this guy blows my mind it's part jealousy it's part um obsession i don't i don't think i want to do this but i just i'm yeah i'm i'm totally jealous of it so rob you are my strava nemesis i he the man churns out 800k weeks day after day week after week after week and yeah i will go in i will have a look at his ride I will see what power, because again, similar size guy to me, probably a bit lighter than me, and I'll see what he did. So you're you're my nemesis, man. 
On the outside, you're like fair play, great well, win. So, On the inside, they're like, oh, fuck you, I could have, okay. I could have, I could have done that. <laughs> yeah, it's so, sort of on that topic. Vanderpool uh, just said that he no longer feels like he wants, he needs to share his Strava files. I that is so weird to me when pros don't want to do that. Like how and how awesome it is when. Why can't you show all your data? Like, what is the problem? Jay's done the same. He strips his power now, doesn't he? I was of your kind of opinion, Tyler, until I hear him talk about him getting ready for races and what his opponents are up to. He can break down pretty much exactly what an opponent is going to do on a climb, on a very gradient of climb, they have so much information on their rivals to just continue to put it out there for free. Jay knows when he gets to the bottom of the climb and he knows he's with so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so, he knows who wins. I don't think it's great for the rest of us, but, you know, he's in a results-based industry, so I don't I think that's just something we have to we have to deal with. I know that's a s soft answer, but that's my take on it. Thanks so much for watching. If you are on YouTube, make sure to whack that like button, hit the subscribe, and of course, share it on with your mates. If you're listening on a podcast player, please do leave us a rating, and we will see you next week.